We're privileged tonight to have Inga Auerbacher giving our keynote address. Since 1981, she has been lecturing on the Holocaust and sharing her story as a survivor. She's spoken to thousands of people all over the world, appearing on many radio and television programs, and her story is the subject of the award-winning documentary film, The Olympic Doll. In addition to her work as a chemist for 38 years, she's also a gifted and well-established writer. More than 50 of her poems and numerous articles have been published. A songwriter, too, she wrote the lyrics, We Shall Never Forget, the only original song presented at the first world gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors in Jerusalem. She is the recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor and the Louis E. Yavner Citizen Award. And we are so honored to have her here tonight as we commemorate Yom HaShoah. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. It's such an honor for me to be here today. I listen to you almost every Friday, and I've always had a wish to come here in person. I hope it will happen soon when I my problems with my back, herniated disc. I think some of you might know about things like that. I'm trying to get better. One thing is quite interesting today. When you light the candle, I want to light one for my beloved grandmother. She was one out of 14 children. Four of her brothers fought in World War I. We were born in Germany. And um, today, um, two of her brothers gave their lives for Germany, and she lies in a mass grave near Riga, Latvia, in a mass grave in a forest. I want to light another one, my best friend in the camp. Her parents were uh, well, her father was half Jewish. He, she he had a great a grandmother who was Christian, and her mother was Jewish, so she was considered Jewish. I want to light one candle for her. She was de, uh, brought up as a devout Christian. And for me, it's very important to get to know other people, to live with other people. I live in Jamaica, Queens, a very special place because it has so many kinds of people. On one side is a devout Muslim family, the other is a Hindu family, and then a Christian. And all these four religions live side by side in harmony. And I think it's just wonderful that you share this Yom HaShoah with the Christian faith. We all have red blood. We're all children of God. I'd like to give you now my presentation. Can everybody hear me? Yes, pretty good. Out of the ashes, our spirits rise. Tears rain down from the weeping skies. We have suffered and endured the fire, immense horrors and miles of barbed wire, history's greatest evil and hell. The world was deaf. Where was the light? There seemed no end to the long, long night. We shall never forget. Minds were dulled by bombs of hate. We saw the truth. It began to unfold. You may kill the body, but never the soul. I am one of the one and a half million silent Jewish girls and boys. I am here today to be their voice. I was born on December 31, 1934. Don't figure out the years. I tell you, you don't have to look at a, 
a, you know, at Facebook or something where you figure out the age. I'm, I'm 88 years young, remember that. So I was born December 31, 1934, to a middle-class Jewish family in Kippenheim, a village in southwestern Germany. I remained an only child. Papa had served in the German army in the First World War. He was wounded and was decorated with an iron cross. Our world crashed when my parents and I were included in the August 22, 1942 transport from Stuttgart to the Terezin concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. I was seven years old, wearing a yellow star with the word Jude, meaning Jew, imprinted on it. And I was given the number Roman numeral 13-1-408, the youngest in a group of close to 1,200 people, the youngest in the group of close to um, 1,200 and, um, and even more. I arrived together with my parents with a few belongings and my beloved doll, Marlene, in my arms. Terrazin was an old fortress town converted into a concentration camp. It served as a holding area before sending the inmates to be killed in the gas chambers of Auschwitz and other killing centers. Life was especially harsh for children. We slept on the floor, or if lucky, on straw-filled mattresses packed like sardines on double and triple deck bunk beds. We grew up fast. The most important words in our vocabulary were bread, potatoes, and soup. We got used to the cards piled with dead bodies. Three times a day, we stood on lines, in the long lines holding our metal dishes to receive our meager food rations. Most of the kitchens were located in the open courtyards of the large barracks. It was especially hard in the winter, waiting in the bitter cold. Breakfast consisted of coffee, a muddy-looking liquid, which always had a horrible taste. Lunch was a watery soup, a potato, and a small portion of turnips or so-called meat sauce, and dinner was again soup. By the time the people reached the barrels from which the food was ladled out, they were so hungry and exhausted that they immediately gulped their portion down. Mice, rats, fleas, and bedbugs were our constant companions. We played in the garbage heap to dig for rotten potato peels and turnips to still our hunger pain. We were finally liberated on May 8th, 1945, by the Soviet Army. I was 10 years old. I had spent three years in this hell. About 140,000 people had been sent to Terezin. Of those, 88,000 were sent mainly to Auschwitz to be killed, and 33,000 died of starvation and diseases in Terezin. Of 15,000 children sent to Terezin, very few survived. Most were sent to Auschwitz to their death, including my best friend and bunkmate, Ruth. I never forgot her. 
and all the murdered children as they walk together with the mothers into the gas chambers in Auschwitz and other camps thinking what will, that water will come out of the shower heads and the mother in desperation whispers hope for life until they gasp for their last breath. Hold me tight. Here is a poem I wrote one day for my book, I'm a Star. And thinking, how did Ruth feel and her mother as they clung to each other in fright, but still hope in their hearts that they will survive? Come with me, my child. Hold my hand. Be calm, my child. Do not try to understand. Don't be afraid, my child. Walk with pride. You know, your mother is here at your side. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light. A mother is giving hope in a place where is no longer hope. No, no, don't look at the chimneys. See the blue sky. My arm is around you to protect you. Don't cry. Come close. Let the blow fall, blows fall on me. There'll be a day when again we'll be free. Again, a mother whispers hope to her child. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Soon we'll see the light. Give all your belongings to them. Quickly undress. One day soon, we will again have happiness. Sleep, my child. I have no more to give. Oh, God! Oh, God! We're not going to live. Hold me tight. Day has turned to night. Hold me tight. A miracle occurred. My parents and I survived together. Most of the members of my family did not return home from the camps, including my beloved grandmother, who was shot in a forest near Riga in Latvia. And I went to that place a few years ago where they had so many graves not real graves, but cement around uh, the bodies that thousands were lying there. I, I went really berserk, I will tell you. I couldn't believe it. I kept on screaming for my grandmother, and I left that place with tears in my eyes. We immigrated to America in May 1946. Our destination was New York City. Unfortunately, my newfound freedom was short-lived, and I became very ill from the consequences of my life in terrorism. I was diagnosed with a severe case of tuberculosis of both lungs. Years of hospitalization and complete bed rest plus painful procedures followed. Finally, Drugs were discovered to give me a cure. During my long illness, I found solace in writing, which gave me a purpose in life and took away the loneliness I was feeling. Eventually, I returned to school at age 15. After the loss of eight years in, in school, um, I we attained a college degree in chemistry and worked for 38 years in the medical field. Six published books followed, including I Am a Star, which is now going into the ninth language. It will be published in Czechoslovakia. 
I'm very happy about that because Terrazin is very nearby. I can't wait until I meet the Czech children reading I'm a Star in Czech. By the way, it is in Spanish too. Yo soy una estrella. And um, I made this title not because I am a movie star, I am something special, but I turned this ugly symbol into something um, positive. And I want to show you um, the star. Let me see where I have this. Here. Here. I have the star with me today that I wore because every child from the age of six on in Europe, mainly Germany, Czechoslovakia, um, all over Europe, and it, I had to wear this. This is my original star that I wore. Maybe I can get up here because I think it's really important you see it. Thank you. From the age of six, you had to wear the stars, saying Yude, Jew, in Hebrew-like letters. Came in different languages. We had to pay for this star. It came on a piece of cloth, very bad cloth, and we had to cut it out. My mother put some uh, uh, some material on the back. You can cut, you know, you could sew it on. You can still see the threads on this star. It was torn off. I turned, uh, tore it off on May 8, 1945, and I was liberated by the Soviet army. And that's why I chose the word, I am a star, turning this negative symbol into something positive. To me, every human being is a star, deserves the right to live, be happy, and in conclusion, and here also, by the way, since I have it here, I have the first page of my order for transport. Very few people have that still. It's about six pages. Here's the first page. And my number was, I do not have a number on my arm. I do have a number, and the number tattooed on the arm was only in Auschwitz. In a way, these people who had it, they were in a sense, well, you couldn't call it luck, but they were used for slave labor, and so that they can find them always. You know, you number this, you number that. You didn't have a name anymore, you had a number. So mine was Roman numeral 13 1 408. Believe it or not, once I played those numbers in Lotto, I figured that must be a lucky number. I'm alive. I didn't get it. It's okay. I'm alive. I'm happy to be here. Now, in conclusion, my hope, my prayer, and my wish is for every child to grow up in peace without hunger and prejudice. And I thank you. And I would like you all in unison saying, Shalom, it means peace, hello and goodbye. We wish peace for this world, to live together in harmony, no matter what religion we practice. We are all children of God, and I thank you.